Uh, before we start with the, uh, uh, with the talk, uh, just a question. Uh, how many of you have done a uh, library cluster before in the computer? Okay, good. How many uh, gave up because it wasn't working? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, there's always at least one in it. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, I would start by telling that uh, library clustering is very easy do. It's really, really very easy. You know when, uh, when something is very, like, what is very easy? Very easy is when you exactly know how to do it. So, why, because we've done it so many times, it's so easy for us, I mean, we as a library, that we're like kind of all the time surprised why people have problems with that. Maybe we are not explaining that very well, so I'll try to do that for you now. So you basically will start uh, usually developing with uh, like one node, like this one. And uh, what is typically a good idea, and I actually call this first now. Okay. So what is really a good idea is to have something proxying request to your library node, whether or not it's cluster. It's typically something that you put in front, like a bunch of server or something that serves a number of different purposes. Um, like the way you see here, you could do some uh, uh, SSL acceleration, like terminating SSL so up, up before you go to the, uh, the portal. Um, or you can, uh, you can use it to serve a static content, which is typically much faster than what your uh, application server will do, uh, because those servers are simply designed for that. Um, you can also use it to do compression and all kinds of things. So, <clears throat> That's probably the first thing you should think of before you even start thinking about clustering is offloading the thing to, that you can offload. This way you will give the right tools the right job and you will have more resources to do other things on, um, uh, on the library side. Um, then when you have something like this running, basically you can just use it as a load balancer and connect to more library instances. That's kind of the first step. So whether you use the same solution or not, it depends on a lot of different things. But you could. You could use just Apache to do the load balancing. You could have a hardware load balancer. It very much depends on your infrastructure. Um, there just has to be something that is capable of doing the load balancing. And load balancing actually is one of the very important things when we talk about clustering because you need to decide you are the one who well, we can not do it on a platform base because we just deliver a platform that will be used in many different situations. So whatever we assume is going to be right for some people and very wrong for some other people. So you want that knowing your project and your limitations and your constraints and your requirements you need to decide like how you design your infrastructure. Um, like one of the important things is how you balance the, the, the load. You may have a different size of servers that you want to just try to push more loads to, to the more powerful machines and less to the less powerful machines. You could say that you have more customers that are visiting mobile web pages than a, a, a standard web pages or, or vice versa and then like direct ones to, to like a, a few machines and uh, and some other less machines. That is actually very important to understand what is the actual flow, where the people are coming from, where they are trying to get to, and, and, and set up this directly. So you don't push the load on the machines that are not supposed to handle that, that, that big load. Because basically, when we talk about clustering, uh, there are two major, two major reasons to do cluster in the first place. One is uh, high availability. Right, so if one node goes down, all solution or your solution is still working with the other node. And there is the other reason is performance. Right, you want to be able to put more requests. Uh, there are also other cases like disaster recovery and so forth that we'll be not covering this for now. But basically, two major, two two, two main points are like high, high availability and um, uh, and performance. So you need to tune this very well. And one important thing here at that point is um, a sticky session. That's the point that people often forget about. And then, uh, we'll come back to this in a, in a few minutes, but I just want to point it right now. It is very important to have a sticky session. It will help you in many situations. You can go away without that if you cluster differently. 
but the most efficient way of uh, doing clustering is uh, by configuring the balancer to always use the same machine which also already has a session with the client. This way you can avoid uh, a lot of uh, uh, overload. So when you have your, cl your cluster connected in your load balancer and everything, now it's time to actually make things work together. So the first thing obviously is to connect all your library nodes to a common database. And that's pretty much everyone knows, so pretty much everyone does that. And we often get this question, well, wait a minute, is, it the, is the database uh, itself cluster? Well, one thing to understand is, from a library perspective, it doesn't matter. I mean, if it's not, it's obviously a single point of failure. But it is not the job of Liferay to make your database cluster. This is your DBAs or the people that are far more than us aware of the database solution who actually take care of that. From a Liferay perspective, we just use JDBC connection. And we connect to the database and we expect to use it as, a, as normal. What you do behind that, it's, it's really not important. You can, there can be a cluster, or there can be whatever solution your database is supporting. Uh, for library, it doesn't matter. All you need to do make sure is that we can library can use the database the same way, whether or not uh, it's clustered. And what is the level of redundancy? How how the replication is going? Things like that. That goes beyond like library. Then that, that is a task that your database will typically handle much more efficiently than, than Lifer will do. So, are we ready when we have the same database? Well, of course not, because we probably have some more things to, to use, like documents. Uh, so, what we need to do is actually share the documents, make sure that all the, the nodes in the cluster are using the same uh, documents. And we can use uh, shared file storage for that. Now, it's easy to say, gets a little bit more complicated when you actually want to do it because there are many different options. And the first and most obvious option is, I hope you can read that. Uh, and we've got anyway, this application, this presentation is available online so you can go back to it. Um, is to use a shared storage. It could be the NAS or a SAN. Uh, it could be whatever is available in your infrastructure. Basically coming down to a mounting a remote hard drive or a remote partition to all of your nodes and putting the stuff there uh, and so everyone else, uh, all the nodes can see it. That's probably the easiest and the most efficient solution uh, that you can use. The thing is, there are also like consequences. If you mount a, a, a remote track that is very slow, that goes over the network that is very slow, well, you'll probably see some, some bad performance. So, like, that is one of the things, like IO speed, here it's very important. You, whatever you do as your solution, you make sure it's fast enough. It's as, at least as fast as local is. Because otherwise, it, especially in, in some cases, like for example, heavy publishing, um, you know, staging live and things like that, where you have to copy a lot of files back and forth, it may actually downgrade your performance really, really bad. Um, <clears throat> another thing to use in some cases is the CMIS uh, storage. And those, by the way, here, are the configuration that you need to do in uh, portal properties to make that work. Um, so the CMIS uh, is basically putting all the data in CMIS storage. Um, but this is a good solution if your uh, document repository is backed up by some other product that supports CMIS. But that is limited to the CMIS protocol itself. You need to understand uh, the CMIS standard and what it is capable of doing. And it is not capable of doing everything that Liferay can do. So if you can live with the limitation of the CMIS and your data is, has to be in some other system, that's, not, that's one option to do. Another option is to put the data in a database. Well, I typically advise against that because no matter what your database is, it is not designed to contain binary data. So typically this is slow and this comes with performance penalty, but if you have no other options or for whatever reason need to use it, you just use the DB store book. One thing that used to be the default in Liferay before version 6.0 was the JCR storage. Basically, back in the old days in version 5, we were putting 
Paul was talking to J. Star Worcester, backed by Jeff Robin. Um, we moved away from that intentionally because GCR is kind of very slow, especially uh, the Rabbit implementation. Things probably have improved since then. There are probably some implementations out there, especially from uh, like uh, high-level vendors that are dealing with this much better these days. But still, I think the, uh, using the, the file system, it's much more efficient than using a GCR uh, representative. And also, if you are on a, a cloud solution like Amazon Cloud, you will probably want to investigate the S3 uh, storage. Uh, we also have a book for that. If you are on Amazon, all you need to do is just use the S3 uh, the cloud storage and then put your data on, on Amazon S3 and it will be shared with all your clients. If you are an enterprise customer, there is also a documented storage, a dedicated plugin for those very particular use cases where you actually want to keep your data in Documento, uh, then you can use a Documento hook and, and, and just uh, get it from there. Anyway, whichever solution you choose, this should be bring you to the point where all the data is shared between all the nodes. Different performance, different issues with that, but, uh, but, but it should be there. So you have your own database, and you have the file storage, and is that it? Well, the question that often comes up is, what about session replication? Um, and it's a very, very valid question, um, which brings us back to the uh, sticky session uh, flag I was uh, pointing out earlier. Because when it comes down to, to session replication, there is one very important question that you need to answer before you do anything else, which is, do you really need it? If you do, well, a sticky session is an application server functionality. It has basically nothing to do with life rate. You need to configure that on your application server level. So whether you're using Tomcat, JBoss, uh, WebLogic, or whatever, you need to figure out what's the proper way of doing session replication on that particular application server. And life rate will work just fine with that. It is prepared to work with that. But the thing is, 99% of the time, I would say, you don't need session replication because the only purpose of session replication is you don't if if you don't want to lose any data if one of your servers comes goes down, right? So if you are in a very uh, for example e-commerce uh, solution and uh, and you're really worried about these five people that have started ordering products. Uh, and, and they're on some server, and the server goes down, and they will lose their five order forms. If that's a critical issue for you, then you probably need session replication. Other than that, I would say it's, it's ignorable. It's, 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 not, it's like not, not that important, particularly if you take into account how session replication works. Well, it works differently on different application servers, uh, and some of them have uh, like some optimizations, but generally speaking, it basically every time something changes in the session, every time you make a request, it will serialize the whole session and send it to all the other machines in the node. So this introduces a very, very much of an overhead that goes to the servers that are exchanging data all the time, just for the simple reason that if something goes wrong at some time, some other server will be able to take it from the point where it ended. So it's up to you to decide whether or no that's the price worth paying. And that's pretty much all I have for uh, session replication. So are we ready? Uh, well, not really, because LifeRay is using heavily caches. Basically, if you've been in the web application development uh, for quite some time, you should know by your experience that nothing speeds up things like caches, right? All the round trips with the database are typically expensive, so you introduce caches to uh, actually avoid the, 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 the trip to the database and serve data much faster. And when it comes to caches, <coughs> the thing that I almost always hear from customer is, well, can we just you know, put the things in memcache, for example? Um, which brings us to the uh, central cache or data grids. Um, basically what this means is that you have your instances, and you have one big thing, which is your cache somewhere, right? And everyone is putting stuff in there, right? And then reading in there. That sounds like a perfect solution, 
But when you look closely, uh, you can just compare the, 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 the upsides and the downsides of it. Well, it isn't limited, it's like virtually limited. It's limited by whatever infrastructure you can provide. Uh, it, it guarantees that it's consistent, right? It, it, things are not getting like out of order. Uh, it's somewhat fault tolerant, like mostly it is, but it is much slower because everything that you want to cache will go over the wire. Uh, so it's like no local caches, and everything is cached globally. So if you want to cache something for your instance only, which doesn't make any sense for the other nodes, you cannot do this. You still need to go over the wire and put it in this global place, right? So everything is shared, and that again, you need to maintain, which is, uh, I think, one of the, the issues is you need to maintain a third-party solution. So if you have your uh, in your company, the experts of whatever the, the, the caching solution uh, you choose, that may be actually a good option. But other than that, if something goes wrong, you better have the support from, this, uh, from whatever the solution is. So we don't have this out of the box in life, right? There is no nothing that allows you to just turn on uh, like um, a data grid and, and use whatever solution. Uh, we at some point used to have a life rate to our bucket edition. To be completely honest with you, I don't know what's the status of that. I don't think it's actively um, developed anymore. Um, and apart from Terracotta, there is the Memcache that I already mentioned. And there is also a Hazelcast, Hazel another product, open source that you can use. Um, it should be fairly simple to implement your own solution in that way because all the caching infrastructure in Liferay is developed as interfaces. Uh, and as like, it's like, a, like a framework, so you can just deliver your own implementation of it and use whatever term of the Memcache and Hazelcast. But you've been warned that it actually may downgrade your performance. You need to be very careful about uh, features like uh, MVCC, like multi-value uh, version control and things like that. What we have out of the box is cache replication. And we are using EH cache for that. And this basically works in a little bit different way. Like each server has its own cache. And when you uh, turn on clustering, they just start synchronizing. So something shows up here, and it's automatically replicated, and so forth. And so we are just having the code that keeps these things in sync. OK? So now the, the, the up and down sides are it is fast, because you are saving things to the local memory. There's no, no run trip over the network, nothing like that. You can have both local and shared storage. So you can say, I just want to store this in my local cache, that's fine. Um, so it, it doesn't uh, reduce performance when something goes wrong with the network, because anyway, all the synchronization is done in the background. So it doesn't affect your, your requests, your, your, your throughput. Okay? And that's something like rate delivered, so you don't have to look for a third party to maintain. Now the, the, the downsides are that the cache size is actually limited. It is limited uh, by the size of your heap. So because it, it stores the memory, you need actually a very large heap to store, to have a very large cache. When you have a very large heap, then you need to actually take additional care of garbage collection. So things are like going one after another, so you need to be careful with that. There, the EH cache solution that we use for caching out of the box has a feature to overflow to disk, so you can use that if you wish, but that brings us back to the situation where we actually need to read from the disk, which is much slower than reading from memory. Um, so and coherence is, of course, uh, an issue. Uh, we're solving that using different <coughs> algorithms. Uh, like, for example, we are uh, not updating things, only expiring things. Uh, if something changes on one node, we don't send the data to the other node, but we just say to the other node, this thing changed, and it is removed from the cache from the other node, and then it's going to be given from the database and put back into the cache on that node itself. So we try to optimize the um, things as much as we can, but there are still two downsides you need to be aware of, which may or may not be downsides for you, is that each JVM maintains its own cache, and that uh, it is somewhat uh, a little bit more complex if you configure it. So let's look at the configuration then. 
first thing you need to do is just say plus parallel can equal to true. And that's the property that tells LifeRay you're now running in a cluster mode and you should be clustering your cache. Um, then, well, if you only do that, first of all, I'm this bit. If you only do that, and that's, that's actually the only thing you could do if you're not an enterprise customer and running a LifeRay CE, uh, is the cache is enabled and it works in, in a way, well, but for, say, for synchronization, there are two important things. One is discovery. The, the, the nodes need to be able to discover themselves. And then is the actual data exchange. So if you only do this, what we will do is we'll use multicast for discovery, and then we'll use ROI protocol to exchange data. So if you are in this situation, you better make sure that your database administrators are fine with multicast. Um, uh, but if you are in a bank, they are not. Um, and, uh, and then, ROI threads will be used for each cache for synchronization. For synchronization. So you, we, out of the box, have about between two or 300 caches in the portal. So if you just do this, consider each of your nodes will be running between two and 300 threads responsible for synchronization. So that's, that's really going to impact performance. Okay? Uh, so what we've done for our enterprise customers is we've developed a plugin called uh, EHDH cluster plugin. It's available from LifeRay Marketspace. You can freely download. Well, if you are an enterprise customer, you can freely download it. And this is the property that actually enables it to to, to change the uh, clustering mechanism. And this one will actually not use the uh, uh, like directly multicast. It will for both options. It will be used JGroups. JGroups is a very uh, popular clustering solution. And you can actually configure JGroups. Uh, whether you want to have multicast or unicast or uh, how your data is going to be exchanged uh, and things like that. So there's another more, one more important property which is how to detect. Um, this is for discovery. And uh, if you look at the original library properties files, you may be surprised to see that the value of this is Google, like www.google.com semicolon A. Uh, personally, I was shocked when I saw that. Um, <laughs> the tricky part here is how we use this. Uh, because we need to bind uh, uh, JGroups to our network interface, uh, and we probably would provide you with a very complicated configuration for how you want to bind uh, your JGroups. But that's already provided with JGroups, which is trying to simplify things here. And basically what this means is try to connect to whatever here is. So if there is a google.com, LifeRay will try to connect. It's not going to actually connect, it's just going to create a socket. And when it creates a socket, it will figure out which network interface is used by that socket, and then it will bind JGroups to that network interface. So it's kind of like a, a quick way to bind your LifeRay to a network interface. And here comes the warning. If you are in a situation where your LifeRay is an internal network has a different network interface between the instances than the one that goes to the internet, you're in trouble. You, you cannot rely on this because it will discover the network interface that goes out to the internet and not the network interface that is in the local network. So for this, then you avoid this and you need to manually configure the JGroups itself and tell this is the network interface to pop to. Um, okay. And then there are two more properties, like cluster link channel properties, which are control and transport. Those define what you use for the control, uh, for the discovery, and for the transport. And now, if this uh, sounds, seems like a very uh, complicated XML files, we didn't do this. This is a JGroups uh, configuration. Um, and this, what you see here, basically comes from the JGroups jar. If you open the JGroups jar, uh, there are a bunch of examples in there about how to configure different protocols and things like that. So this comes from there. So basically, it, I'd say 99% of the time, it's perfectly safe to just copy the one that is most common for you. Like if you want to do a TCP, uh, then just copy the TCP one. Uh, and one thing here is this peer discovery that you need to configure. And then you have a number of, of, of ways to do peer discovery. One thing is the JDC ping. We typically use that when we can. Basically, this says 
uh, uh, like uh, use the database for the discovery. So every node will register itself in the database in a particular table, and they will use this information to figure out which node is in the cluster, which is running, and so forth. If that's not an option, uh, you can actually use a TCP ping. The TCP ping it's, it's probably the most stable solution because it uses the direct connection, but it requires you to list the, the servers that are participating, you know, or at least an initial amount of servers. And if none of this is running, then it may not function properly. So the downside of the TCP is that you need to actually manually configure the IP addresses of the service, um, which is sometimes good, sometimes not that good solution. If you're running on the Amazon uh, Cloud, then you can use the S3 ping. Uh, and this is a only Amazon specific, anything else will not work. And if you're on the Rackspace Cloud, there is also a Rackspace ping. Like all this, again, is not invented by LifeRay. This is purely JGroup's configuration. And there is far more than that. And I really uh, advise if you do serious clustering, you just go and read the documentation of JGroups and what are all the possible options and what is the best solution in, uh, uh, in your particular case. Okay, caches now. Are we ready? Well, unfortunately not yet. Is, uh, there is one more thing that is uh, to, take, to be taken into account, which is indexing. Uh, we are heavily using indexing and life rate to, again, speed things up. And um, the default option in cluster and environment is index replication. So basically, again, each node has its uh, index. And when you enable that by saying uh, cluster link enable and will simply replicate right through, this will happen. You change, you index something on one node, then going to send notification to all the other nodes, and they will update. Um, now, this is good if you don't have too many too many nodes in your cluster, because the, as the number of nodes goes high, your servers will likely do not a lot more than talking to each other about synchronizing indexes. Um, so. Uh, if you really have a huge cluster, you probably want to change that. And people typically say, okay, so let's do shared index. So we put an index on a common storage, which is a database or shared file system, and we'll just point all the indexes to that common place. So they all use one index. Technically, that sometimes even works. Assuming that file locking conditions are properly set. Because if you put this on an NFS3 partition, it will not work. Because it doesn't handle properly file locking. NFS4, I think someone claimed it worked, I personally don't know. Putting it in a database typically works because databases are transactional by nature. But because you have like a, a locking condition on a database, it makes things a lot, a lot slower. So it is a solution sometimes, but it's not the one that I would personally recommend. Uh, what I personally recommend is to use what we have as a pluggable enterprise search. This is basically an infrastructure in LifeRay that allows you to hook an external solution to use as an indexer and search solution. And out of the box, we uh, have a hook uh, for a uh, like pluggable hook for Solar. Solar is a very popular uh, search solution, being very popular for the last few years. So what you need to do in this case is, I was tempted to put all the configuration here, but I just didn't want to show like 10 screens of XML configuration. And besides, this is very well documented on the library documentation, uh, official documentation. So if you want to uh, know the details about where to put what, just go on library.com slash documentation, and you'll find everything there. The basic idea is you need to install the um, application, the, the, the plugin, on each library node and configure one other node or many other nodes, depends on what you want to do, with Solar, uh, and then connect those. Uh, there is some file copying that you need to do because we, uh, in, inside that plugin is the configuration for the Solar itself that you need to get from the plugin and put it in here so your Solar will actually know what are the entities that comes from LifeRay, how to index them, and things like that. As I said, it's all this product, it's like step-by-step -step procedure that you can find in the documentation. But basically what this is going to happen is, 
all the reliability nodes will be tucked into the external solar, and thus they all share the same information. Anyone see what's the downside of that? Life gray is fine, it's faster, but solar becomes the single point of failure. If your solar goes down, then the whole thing goes down. So if you want to do this, you need to cluster solar. And now clustering solar can be tricky. Uh, with solar 3, I would say it's really very tricky. Solar 4, which is the newest version that showed up like last year, I believe, uh, use, uh, already uses Zookeeper, so it's, it's much easier to cluster. But again, that's a third party solution that you, you need to understand how it works, how to cluster it itself, uh, and, uh, and then how to, uh, uh, how to deal with it. Another thing that you could use, not right now, but hopefully in several months from now, is Elasticsearch. We're actually uh, right in the process of uh, uh, switching from uh, Lucene, which is the default implementation uh, in the side library, to a uh, solution called Elasticsearch. If you're not familiar with Elasticsearch, try it. Uh, I personally, not, not speaking now as a library employee, but personally, I would, uh, I would say that the first time I saw it, I fell in love with it. It's really, really the, the indexing that I, I ever thought it, the way it should be. So Elasticsearch is like, it can run on a single node, it can cluster itself, uh, and, uh, and so forth. And uh, we're actually trying to move to Elasticsearch for 7.0 to make this clustering thing even, even, even better. Um, there is a proof of concept somewhere on the GitHub and the repository is well written by me. Don't use this one because it's really a proof of concept. Um, and there should be also uh, a code in the, uh, in the master branch for the Elasticsearch. And I know there are some companies that are already working with that on Secret 2. However, it is not official and not supported. It will be uh, in, in 7.0. So, are we done? More or less? Yes. If you've been paying attention though, before I uh, end, if you've been paying attention though, this is the time uh, where you should be pointing at me that uh, the things I'm telling you are not consistent. Because for the cash, I was telling you, don't go with a third party solution, use our own implementation, and now for indexing, I'm telling you exactly the opposite. Don't use replication, go for third party solution. Okay, there is an inconsistency here, but it's on purpose. You need to understand how those are used. Caches are used heavily, but they're not crucial. They're not critical. If something is not in the cache, we'll still go to the database and find it. The only problem you have an issue, the only time you have an issue with the cache is actually if it is in the cache and it's wrong. Right? That's all your only issue, because if, if, if you have the wrong data in the cache, well then you assume it's the right one and you display it to the customer. But if it's not there, you still go get it from the database and, and, and update the cache to inform. For indexing though, your index is the main source. You go find something in the index and you display it. Right? You, don't go to the, you don't go to the database. If you don't find it in the index, you assume it's not there. Right? So this is like indexing in terms is much more critical for your application. Than, than caching itself. I mean, caching is just going to make things slower, but it will still work. Indexing, wrongly configured, may actually cause that your portal will not work. Okay, so um, quickly, it's not on the slides, uh, but just uh, to, uh, to, to, because this question always shows up, so I'm just going to answer it before someone asks, is how do we know that it works, that it's configured correctly? How do we know it works uh, right? Uh, we unfortunately still don't have any tool in the portal itself that's going to just you know show you green or red lights and tell you yeah your cluster, cluster is okay or it's not. We'll probably have that someday. Um, but at, at, the, at the time, at, at this moment, it's actually easy to do it. You need to just know which features in life rate depend on which framework. For example, all the, the uh, uh, documents and, uh, and web content use cache heavily. So the easiest way to check whether your cache is configured correctly is create an article on one node, uh, go to the other node and display it. It will be, if it shows up, then it's either from the cache or from the database, you don't know that. Then change it from the other node, 
and go back to the first node and display it. If you see it updated, it means the cache was uh, reset, because if it was not, it would get it from the cache from the first instance that has the old version of it. Right? So if that works, that simple exercise, the error cache is configured correctly. To check if your indexing is currently configured correctly, all you need to do is go and uh, list the users. The user list that you see in my frame comes from the index. If you don't see any users, re-index the whole thing. If you still don't see the, any users, well, then probably something's wrong with the, uh, with the configuration of the uh, index. And file storage is, of course, obvious. If you add document from one node and it doesn't show the other one, well, it's not configured correctly. Uh, and if you, your database is wrong, then it will probably not work at all. So <coughs> you'll, you'll figure that pretty fast. Okay, so that's pretty much everything I have for you today. Uh, I'll be here around all day long, so feel free to uh, find me and ask a question. I think we have time for a question. Ah, yeah, I think we can have a question now. Uh, that's a super question. When you have sticky sessions, why do you need to replicate your cache? Because all the stuff will be on that one node. Okay, that's a good question. Uh, because it's what's going to happen when your server goes down. And you get from recreate data? It has nothing to do with sticky session because, uh, well, sticky session will just make sure that if I make my second request, will go to the same server that my first request went to. But my, uh, the other user next to me may be actually using the other server. So if you don't have a cache replication, then this other user, it, it will be fine for me because I will be still using the same server. But for this other user, my changes will not be visible because he will still see a stable data. Does that answer your question? My name is Natalia. Uh, my question is, uh, is there any advantage in uh, enterprise mission in terms of clustering support? Or it's pretty much the same as in community mission? Well, there is, as I was trying to point out earlier. Let me just go back to this. So, I was, as I said, this here is only enterprise. Uh, this here is only enterprise mission. Uh, and for indexing, I think for indexing it's more the same, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but yeah, there is, and there are definitely performance optimizations, uh, which maybe, uh, like apart from the, the API changes and functionality changes that are different between the two versions, there is definitely more uh, um, enterprise is more optimized for, for all these types of things. Basically, well, it's, it's not that we are not testing how it works on, on EE, oh, on CE. But like for CE, it is sufficient that it works. Uh, and for EE, it's often the customer will say, well, we don't only care about being, it, it, it works, we, we also have it to work much faster, much better. So all these optimizations, they are typically done in the EE branch, and then they will probably show up in the CE, but that will be the next version. Thank you. Any other question? No more. Sure. Well, I had this in the presentation and I intentionally remove it uh, because it's, uh, it's a lot more about the infrastructure than about life for itself. So uh, typically it depends on your application. Well, not typically, it depends on your application server. From life perspective, every plugin needs to be deployed on every node, period. You can do that manually, that's perfectly fine. Or you can use your application server feature for farming. Like most, if not all, application servers can uh, allow you to, to create a farm. And then you would have a single point of deployment, and then it will copy the file to each of the nodes. Uh, but personally, what I don't like about it is that most application servers combine this feature with session replication. So you just say, 
cluster WebSphere or cluster uh, uh, whatever JBoss, and unless you take the time to actually configure the application server, like what you want to get the cluster and how and so forth, and you really know how to do it, by default, when you say cluster it, it will cluster everything, and it will also cluster a session, a session application, which I typically don't want because I don't want my service to copy all this data back and forth. So it's on the application server level, it's not on, on, on the library. The library as such doesn't have any feature that allows you to, to, to have a single point of deployment. And then we probably will never have because this is like competing with the application servers and it's already too complex to, uh, to, to support so many different application servers. So I personally don't think this is going to happen in the near future. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, as I said, I'll be around. Feel free to ask me any questions. Um, now I'm going to pass it to Olaf, who's going to be showing you even more cool stuff.